Chapter 7 The Bridge The Archon was already turning again, her sails snapping and cutting against the wind, when Jim toppled to the deck of the aftcastle in a shivering heap. A dozen hands lifted him to his feet, while others clapped him on the back in vigorous praise, though most of the crew seemed to be urgently working the rigging. Jim stood there, wringing wet, staring back at faces that had seemed so indifferent to him before, but now wore a motley mix of respect and amusement. He was suddenly acutely aware of his bad eye, exposed and bloodied as it was. He fished the wet bandage from his pocket and worked it into place. You saved her, Jim, Wayland said simply. That was... that was very brave. Jim smiled, though a knot of guilt twisted in his gut. He didn't know what it was that had dragged him kicking and screaming through each obstacle. Fear? Cowardice? Whatever it was, it wasn't bravery. Rinks was the brave one, and the girl, and Loken, and here he was taking the credit like some sort of hero. He glanced guiltily at the fairy girl, and his eyes met hers, though he couldn't read them. She was already wrapped in a blanket, with Kelpie busily checking her over, applying salve to her sunburned skin, while Puggle plucked happily at her wet hair. Here, on the Archon, she didn't seem to cause the same alarm as among the people of Shoalhaven, though not everyone was pleased with the new passenger. Okay, okay, sure, well done, well done, Squint. But she's still a girl, eh? Kaber hissed, jabbing a finger at her. Terrible bad luck. Girl on a ship, and now we've got all hell chasing on us, eh? This realisation seemed to spread through the crew, prompting a smattering of nods and muttering. Darge is a girl? Jim answered, pointing at the striking figure that looked on, unreadable and impassive as ever. Darge don't count, Kaber yelled, striding closer to Jim, his copper leg clanging on the deck. More murmurs from the crew, accompanied now by anxious glances toward the fairy girl. Of course she doesn't, and nor does the girl, the captain said, appearing through the knot of onlookers. The bad luck don't apply to the fair folk. Good mother told me. Isn't that right, dear? He turned to the fairy, who met his gaze but didn't respond. Oh, uh, she can't hear you, Captain. She's deaf, I mean. Jim explained clumsily. The captain stared at her thoughtfully. Right. Malvar's girl, yes? Wait, you know her? Jim exclaimed. The captain turned to him for the first time, raising an eyebrow. Yes. And I was hoping to get some explanation for why half of Shoalhaven is chasing us. Well, I can talk to her, Jim offered. For you, I mean. He wants to ask you questions, he signed, demonstrating. Yes, he is. I will tell all I know, the girl replied, using a sign Jim didn't know. Fingers dancing atop her head. He mirrored it back to her with the sign for questioning. It means his name. Then she spelled, Inkainen. He is the captain of the Archon. And again used a sign he hadn't seen before, a ship, along with the sign for time passing. An hourglass, of course, like the Archon's flag. And I am Nix. She spelled, then made a sign like legs kicking through water, and again spelled Nix. He'd never thought to ask her name, this girl that had saved his life. I am Jim, he spelled, and he hesitated before making his own sign name, a legacy of life upon the trossel, a squinting eye. She looked puzzled, then shook her head. Jim, she spelled then rested one hand, a fist with thumb extended, upon an open palm. The sign for help. She twisted it, changing it into the sign for boy, then repeated the new sign and spelled Jim. Boy who helps. Jim smiled at her, swallowing the emotion that swelled in his chest. His hands flexed as if to reply, but he couldn't find the shapes. Right then, you two, Dash with me. 
the captain barked, pointing clumsily at each of them, and then himself, before turning on his heel and striding down the steps toward the quarterdeck. A knot of crewmen followed with him, taking orders as they went. Slip, you have the con. They'll be after cutting us off, using their shallow drafts against us by heading over the sandbar. You know what to do. Find me if there's a problem. Cap, Slip nodded. Where are we headed, Mac? That's what I'm after figuring out. Open water for now. To the sunk. Slip nodded again, and the knot of crew peeled off with him as he began to yell new orders. Jim, Nix, and Darge followed Cap beneath the aft castle, past Wayland's workshop, and into the captain's quarters. Darge closed the door, and the captain turned, leaning on a broad, worn table in the centre of the room. Right, let's start at the beginning. How did she get here? Jim turned to Nix and signed the question, relaying her words to the captain as they came, stopping only for her to explain the many signs that were alien to him. I was taken from Lossalfheim by pirates. How did they get past the cove's defences? Why weren't they heard? They rowed a great ship right into the inner sea. Oars. That's what Tsar was talking about, Darge growled. The ship he offered you. The captain nodded and motioned for Nix to continue. There was a funeral, but I was out swimming. I did not hear them coming for me. Then the good mother did not fire upon them, because they had me on board. There was shame on Nix's face as she signed, and regret. The captain's expression changed upon hearing the word funeral, and he seemed not to hear the rest. Funeral? Whose funeral? Olwen. She was very old. You knew her? I knew her when she was just when, dear. The captain smiled sadly. Now these pirates, what do they look like? What was the ship called? There was a man with a long beard that he seemed very proud of. He smelled different to the others. Wore a green hat. I did not see the ship name. It was the mirror. That man was Captain Narciss, though he was just called Nars when I knew him. He brought you to Shoalhaven? No. He seemed eager to have me gone. Sold me at the first land we met. Then I was sold again, and then to the godsmen. All right. Now this is important. When they sold you, was there an auction? Did they look for many buyers? Nix thought for a moment and shook her head. No, they met at a beach, handed me to another ship that was waiting. The captain and Darge exchanged meaningful glances, the implication lost on Jim. Why? What does that mean? It means it was not a chance raid, explained Darge. They had a buyer lined up. The whole thing was planned. The captain pulled his hat from his head and scratched frustratedly at the flame-red hair beneath. And they knew not to use their engines near the cove, which means... Zar, spat Darge, the venom clear in her voice. No. Cap shook his head. He'd never risk other people finding Lossalfheim. Nars used to sail under Sar on the four more. It's possible he knew how to get there undetected. I think Sar killed Nars and his whole crew when he found out what they'd done. The captain turned back to Nix. When the church, the godmen, bought you, what happened then? What do they do to you? Jim hesitated before signing the question, but the captain urged him on. This is important, Jim. When the godmen... He mirrored her sign. ...took you, what did they want? I had to read their mouths. I did not get everything... But they asked many questions about old stories, about the old tech, and the Scand, and Thule. They had some old relic, with old Scand words. They are searching for something called the Seed of the Fair Folk. They believe it holds the secret to finding Thule. What did you tell them? demanded the captain. Nix hesitated, and Jim saw her fight back a wave of emotion. When they realised I was... broken, 
she gestured toward her ears. And of no use. They wanted to find my home. I think I would have told them everything in the end, but they did not have the hand sign. We must take her home, said Darge simply, seeming suddenly less hard and cruel. No, Cap shook his head. We aren't going to the cove. We'd lead them right there. We need to drop off the map for a while, just until they give up the follow. Jim struggled to process the moving parts. This Captain Narciss had captured Nix and sold her to the church by way of an intermediary. Then Sar, his old boss, had him killed for it. Now the church were after finding the girl's home. They offered 30,000 silver, Jim said, his mind still struggling to fathom that amount of money. If Sar knows where the fairies are, he'll take them right there himself. The captain shook his head. That, in particular, secret is safe with him. Trust me. I do, Jim blurted, realising the words to be true as he said them. Just not him. He had Nurse killed to keep the secret. That and to make sure folk think twice before disobeying him again. Cap glanced at Darge, whose eyes bored into Jim, before continuing. Sar visits the cove every year, Jim. They treat him in exchange for his silence. You saw his son pox. Jim nodded, remembering the leathery black sores that covered the old pirate's bare chest. His skin, like everyone's eventually, slowly losing the battle with the sun's burning heat. It's bad. Would have killed him years ago were it not for the fair folk. He'll not give that up for any amount of silver. They'll look for a while, follow some false leads, but nobody else knows how to get to Lossalfheim. But how do you know that? The captain glanced at Nix and smiled ruefully. Nobody else knows, because I'm the one that found it, Jim. Cap! The door burst open, and suddenly Slip was there, wide-eyed and urgent, a scope clutched in his hands. We've got a problem up here! The problem was actually a dozen problems. Fully twelve ships were chasing them out of harbour. Not the small boats from the jetty, so easily outpaced or swatted aside by the Archon's defenders, but great charging vessels that dwarfed the Archon and came crashing through the spray toward them, gaining as they sailed through the jutting remains of the great city that once stood here. Looks like every freelancer in town is after us, and a few of Sar's franchise too, Slip said, collapsing his brass far looker and shaking his head at the small fleet that gave chase. You must have really pissed them off, Jim, groaned North as he struggled with the ship's wheel, tacking the Archon to and fro against the fierce headwind that robbed them of their speed and set the deck heeling violently to one side and then the other. Jim and Nix had been confined to the deck of the aft castle, where they would be the least obstructive while the Archonauts worked frantically at the sails. Together they watched in awe as the crew climbed ratlins, sprinted the length and breadth of the ship and gathered together, seemingly on instinct, to haul on a line or hoist a yard when needed. Jim checked behind them again. Of the dozen ships that pursued them, it seemed ten were closing in, two of them rapidly. A pair of fiercely angular vessels that belched black smoke from rows of tall chimneys. I thought we were supposed to be faster! Jim yelled as they turned again, the deck lurching beneath him. North jabbed a hand at the oncoming wind. We would be, but not with a red wind. Only thing worse is no wind. On a reach, we'd be flying. He grinned, gesturing at the side of the ship. Jim marvelled that, for all the peril, North was actually enjoying himself. In fact, most of the crew were, even Gam, clinging to his basket atop the foremast that tipped from side to side with every turn. Gam, who was so anxious and afraid... Even he wore a smile. They're gonna have us, Mac, called North, as the captain sprung up the steps to the aft castle and peered after their pursuers, then at their surroundings. The sea was littered with ruins, great crumbling mounds of concrete that jutted from the water like the broken teeth of some drowned giant. Their course, already problematic with the headwind, was further complicated by weaving between them and giving a wide enough berth so as to avoid the treacherous hidden wreckage that lurked below the tide. The obstacles thinned as they made away from land, but at the rate their pursuers were gaining, 
they'd be caught long before reaching open waters. Cap sprung lightly onto the gunwale, staring back past their pursuers. Turn us about, North. Put us on a starboard beam. North held the wheel steady, glancing nervously over his left shoulder at the suggested course. Cap, that'll buy us time, but there's no- Do it now, yelled the captain, freeing a line from the rail and loosing the rearmost sail. Today's not the day they catch us. North put two fingers to his mouth and whistled a trill before throwing the great wheel hard to the left. Jim stumbled as the deck listed, but Nix caught his arm and together they staggered to the port gunnels. Puggles screeched and protested loudly as her nest atop the mizzenmast swung violently with the turn. What happens? Nix signed, managing to free her hands from the rail momentarily. I don't know. Jim replied, staring over the rail toward their new course. The Archon surged forward, her sails suddenly full and pulling as the wind swept across the breadth of the ship. There was nowhere to go. Ahead of them, the water was thick with jutting ruins, and beyond, the coast again. Not Shoalhaven, but the same shore. There was an island ahead, a channel of water separating it from the mainland, but it was connected by a huge, ancient bridge, far too low to be sailed under. Cap? prompted Slip, appearing at the top of the steps, concern written on his face. Slip! Get everyone who's not holding something to the shrouds! the captain yelled. Puzzlement registered briefly upon Slip's face, and then he was gone again, down the steps and running the new orders along the ship. All right, we've got some speed now, yelled North, looking back over his shoulder. But we're cutting right across their path. There's only going to be a hair in it. A hair's all I need, said the captain, grinning as he strode to the wheel. There was a crack of cannon fire and everyone flinched instinctively, though the range was too great, and the shot dropped harmlessly into the water, sending up spray. These eight still with us, yelled Caber from the port side gunnels, and Jim found that the anxious note in the older boy's voice sent a shiver down his spine. Eight on one. We've had worse odds, snapped the captain, silencing him. I don't want to know what happens when we run out of sea, do I? Asked North quietly. They'll try to box us in. Make us land, said Cap. But what do we do, North? Never land, Captain. Never land, Cap smiled and clapped a hand on his helmsman's shoulder. Just keep us pointed at that bridge. I want them to think we've misjudged it. A detachment of crew clambered up the steps and rushed to the great ladder-like ropes that connected each side of the ship to the top of the mizzenmast. Jim could see similar teams lined up alongside the mainmast and foremast further up the ship. The smiles were now tempered with anxious glances, and Jim could see some of the crew plotting the course in their minds, trying to weigh their diminishing lead over the pursuers, while others looked ahead anxiously at the coastline, the bridge, and the island. Someone cried, Chain shot! And there was a hissing, and again the terrible crack of cannon fire, and suddenly the Archon shuddered. Cries of alarm echoed around the quarterdeck, and bodies scattered. Then a heartbeat, and the top third of the mighty central mast came crashing down in their place, tangled and knotted in lines and sails. The great splintered wooden trunk began to slip into the water, slowing the Archon and starting to drag her around, but a dozen pairs of hands quickly sprang into action, cutting it loose and letting it topple free overboard. Jim saw something flash in the captain's eyes. Was it rage? Uncertainty? Fear? With nearly a third of her sail lost, the Archon slowed, and the angular ships behind them began to gain once more. Slip quickly redeployed the shaken quarterdeck crew to bolster those waiting at the remaining masts, but everywhere were nervous glances back toward the pursuers. Even Puggle came swooping down to the relative safety of the main deck to nestle among the low ropes. The captain sprung to the rail before the wheel, the better to be seen by the crew. Arcanauts! he yelled. When I give the signal, you're all to climb, as fast and as high as you can, and hold on! Near forty pairs of hands grasped at the ropes aside each of the two remaining masts, and some crew even climbed atop the gunnels to get a head start. Jim saw Kelpie alongside Boulder. 
Dodge. Slip. Even Waylon, already wiping a sweaty palm on his tecker's robes, ready to obey. Jim turned to Nix and signed, I climb, you stay here, and dashed away before she could reply. Rushing to the nearest shroud, he reached for the lowest ratlin before a thick, tattooed arm emerged from the knot of crew and a sharp shove thrust him staggering backward. He said, Arkanauts, squint. That ain't you, growled Kaber, one arm pointing at him while the other grasped the rope. Jim tried to summon the will to say something back, to assert himself or to climb anyway but he found that any wisp of courage was long since spent. Instead, he just stood there, unable to meet Nix's eye, until North rescued him from his shame. I'll need a hand with the wheel, Jim, he called, and Jim, glad of the excuse, trotted over to him. When the time comes, we'll need to turn into the wind, hard and fast, yeah. And he showed Jim the action of the wheel. Though she'll resist much more than this, okay? Jim nodded and grasped at the rough wooden handles. There was the cracking of gunfire and Jim ducked instinctively, but the range was too great yet for close fighting. Hold fast, yelled the captain, who alone among the crew stared forward, his eyes never leaving the great bridge. Jim followed his gaze. The bridge was mighty made in the old times and by some miracle still standing, though the waters below it had risen enormously. Huge steel cables, as thick as the Archon's masts, were draped between two tall concrete towers. A treacherous, crumbling road spanned the channel between the shore of Shoalhaven to their left and the barren island to their right. Jim thought he might have misjudged it from way out there, but no, the bridge was far, far too low. Both of the remaining masts would be torn from the ship and they'd be left adrift, if none of the ancient road toppled down on them first. But they were running out of room to turn aside. The angular, belching ships behind them roared and were closing in now for the kill. Their guns spoke again, and this time Jim heard the hissing of bullets and saw tears begin to appear in the sails. Climb! the captain yelled. Climb like they are already beneath you! And all as one, the crew flew upwards. Some whip fast and nimble, others slow, but all surging up the long, taut lines toward the mast tops. The bridge was nearly upon them now, and still they had not turned aside. Perhaps he meant for the crew to climb to freedom, escape on the bridge while he and the others went down with the ship. Jim's palms grew sweaty at the thought, and he gripped the wheel tighter. Suddenly. There was another pair of hands, impossibly white, gripping the wheel next to his, and he turned to see Nix, but she too was staring up at the mighty bridge. Little to the left, the captain whispered to North, and Jim felt the wheel turn away from the wind. Chancing a look back, he saw the charging steel armada behind them, closing inexorably. More gunfire, and this time Jim looked up anxiously at the exposed crew, though miraculously none of them were hit. Hold, the captain said, raising a hand ready, his eyes still fixed on the great bridge. Hold! It was too late. With their momentum, they'd never turn aside. They'd be dashed against the... Now! Now, North! Hard to starboard! Yelled the captain, throwing his arm down and sprinting for the portside shrouds himself. The wheel flew, Jim and Nix adding to North's strength, heaving and grasping as the spokes spun and groaned and then stopped. It fought hard against them, fought to turn back, but together they wrestled with it, hanging their weight upon the spokes as the ship listed. And list, she did. The sharpness of the right turn threw her over to the left, and then the weight of the crew, all now clustered at the mast tops, took over, and she kept going, leaning further and further still until the portside gunnels dragged in the water below them. Jim looked up and saw the underside of the bridge, the crew clinging to the mast top, passing harmlessly underneath with barely a yard to spare. A heartbeat and they were clear. The crew exulted as North righted the wheel and the Archon lurched back to upright. There was a terrible, 
iron braying as their pursuers' engines screamed into reverse. The steel ships slammed into one another in their vain efforts to halt and were forced to watch as their quarry sailed into free water beyond the bridge. The Archon had escaped. Days passed as they sailed open water, occasionally glimpsing land off one bow or the other, but still they fled. Of the dozen ships that had pursued them out of Shoalhaven, it seemed two were low enough to pass beneath the great bridge once the crush of larger vessels had cleared. A pair of low-sitting ironclads haunted them, their great steam paddles tirelessly trudging after the Archon, slower but immune to the whims of the capricious wind. By day, the cunning of North and Slip would outsail them, even with one mast lost, widening the lead until they were barely visible plumes of smoke on the horizon. But with the stillness of night, they would claw back their losses, and by dawn would be dark and threatening shadows once more. Despite the damage and the constant state of pursuit, Life aboard the Archon was markedly more pleasant than before. No longer confined to the gibbet, Jim was afforded space to hang a bunk below deck, while Nix was granted a small cabin of her very own. They weren't treated quite as Archonauts. Jim often felt the familiar sting of conversations falling quiet when he entered a room, but they were also not expected to work as hard as the others and had more time to leisure. The sun was cruel and unrelenting, and Nix was forced to choose between wrapping herself in a heavy shawl or confine herself below decks to protect her impossibly pale skin from its burn. But Puggle's constant presence reminded her fondly of home, and Jim found some joy in introducing her to Waylon and Gam, translating for them as they asked about one another's lives. It seemed both Waylon and Gam had visited this Lossalfheim, or the Cove as they called it, many times, though they still had questions aplenty, and answered twice as many as they asked. As the memory of her captivity subsided, Nix began to revel in finally being aboard the Archon, the only ship, until recently, she had ever seen up close, and one that she had grown up on stories about. She was hungry for details about the real-life heroes of those stories, the wily captain, the loyal boatswain, the deadly first mate. Gam delighted in telling her all the ways his big sister was in fact not deadly, but actually quite goofy when the mask slipped. At first, Jim had been reluctant to venture below deck. He'd only been as far as Wayland's workshop and the captain's quarters thus far, and they weren't really below below. He'd spent his whole life confined below decks and was enjoying the novelty of fresh air and being able to see more than a hundred yards in a straight line, but he need not have worried. Life below deck on the Archon could not have been more different than that of the Trossel, except perhaps for the confined space. The first thing he noticed was how ever-changeable the space was. Of an evening, great swinging tables would line the upper deck where the crew would eat together. These would then be cleared away and a dense forest of hammocks would be hung for the night. And by following morning, the space was again cleared and ready for the day's tasks, be that fighting, looting or trading ashore. Always at one end, the galley stove burned, maintained by the ship's cook, a stout, soft-spoken boy called Scup, his arms, like Jim's, crisscrossed with burns. Day and night he would tend the pots, soft-boiling salt rice, adding whatever ingredients they'd managed to scavenge, and somehow making it interesting, new and plentiful enough to feed a crew of fifty-two. Jim learned when to speak and when to listen when to help and when to leave well alone. He learned who to avoid and who to share a joke with, who could spin a good tale and who would teach him if he needed it. Kelpie was ever a kind face. His attentions for the most part focused on those who still bore wounds from the fight for the trussel and those handful that had been grazed by stray bullets in the flight for the bridge. But he found time to wander the ship, checking in with the various teams and cliques and helping where he could. More than once, he changed the bloody bandage over Jim's bad eye and redressed the padded bindings beneath the purple sash that protected Gam's sensitive ears from the noise of daily life. On the third day after leaving Shoalhaven, Jim found himself in Wayland's workshop, 
chatting with Nix and the techsmith, when the captain strode in with slip at his shoulder. Waylon, map please. Oh, uh, yes, of course, blustered Waylon, glancing at Jim and Nix awkwardly. Usually they would be sent out before any of the Archon's secretive texts were used, but today their presence was ignored. Slip helped Waylon remove the heavy wooden tabletop from its pedestal in the centre of the room, stowing it to one side and lashing it fast. Beneath, set into the top of the pedestal, was a great dark glass panel, almost an arm's length across. Waylon busied himself with a trio of small devices in the corner of the room, sliding a small plastic card into one before connecting it to the plinth with a twisted braid of cable. Jim gasped as the panel burst into life, glowing with an eerie white tech light, and then crawling with strange shapes and glyphs. A curious image flashed upon the screen, a great blue-green sphere which then vanished, giving way to a jagged yellow and blue shape, crisscrossed with red lines, dots and small writings. Okay, out and east, commanded the captain, staring at the screen. Waylon clutched a makeshift box, connected to the others by a fragile wire braid of its own, and prodded at the salvaged buttons that covered its surface. The image shrank, and suddenly more of the shape it described was visible. Then it began to crawl slowly across the panel. The yellow gave way to blue, and then back to yellow again. There, that's Shoalhaven, Slip said, pointing to a great red circle set deep into one of the yellow shapes. The captain traced a finger diagonally away from the circle and tapped a finger on a new spot. That puts us here. Jim's brain seemed only now to understand what he was seeing. He knew about maps, of course, but they were little more than a collection of sketches annotated with trade routes and were fiercely guarded by the captains of great shipping lines. This was something wholly different. Right, we need somewhere to hide, maybe find a new mast. Cap went on. There's a calm coming, and we've not shaken those two steamers yet. They'll have us if the wind dies. What about you? Pointed Slip. South of Rila Bay. There's that clutch of small islands. The captain shook his head. We'd have to motor, and their engines are better. What else? What is this? Nix signed to the room, and Jim translated hesitantly. The captain and Slip didn't even register their presence, but Waylon gave a whispered answer. We think they used to use it to tell them where to go. It doesn't do that anymore, but, but it still has a map. Everything for a thousand clicks, from the Cobalt Sea, through Berg, to the edge of the Limnal Sea. Only it doesn't show the Limnal Sea, grumbled Slip. Ah, uh, well, no. It's from before, you see, explained Waylon. Before the, uh, before the flood, we have to figure out what's still left. Although... He trailed off, heading to one of his small screens, his fingers dancing across one of the many panels of glyph buttons. If I may, Captain... He coughed, interrupting their study of the map. I've been working on some code. It seems the map doesn't just contain shape data for the old land. It actually has something they used to call elevation which I think is a measure of how high above the sea the land used to be. I've been experimenting with a way to redraw the bitmap by altering those numbers. Everyone stared at the wheezing techsmith, waiting for him to arrive at his point, but it seemed he had. And that helps us because... prompted Slip. Well, watch. If I offset the sea level... He prodded a button repeatedly, and the map began to change. Slowly, the blue areas bled into the yellow, pushing back their edges, redrawing the coast. Yellow islands formed as areas of high ground held out against the rising blue. Suddenly, it would swallow whole areas, red circles, lines and all. Jim imagined roads, towns, people. Bit by bit, the yellow was drowned. Less than a third of it survived the onslaught of the sea, and most of that which was left was disconnected from its former hole. Jim felt fingers grip his own, and turned to see Nix, staring at the simulated flood, 
her eyes wet with tears. He squeezed her hand. That's it. Stop there. The captain rapped on the panel excitedly, staring at the new coastline. Waylon, you're a genius, whispered Slip, peering at the altered map, his mouth agape. There, that's Shoalhaven, Railer Bay. Fuck, you can even see the cove here. The captain shook his head in disbelief and looked up at Waylon, gravity in his eyes. Nobody can see this, Waylon. You understand? Waylon nodded sincerely and mopped his brow on the much-abused neckerchief. I'll make something, he said solemnly. So where do we go? muttered Slip, peering in awe at the new map. Where once had been a solid block of land, now they stared at a thousand islands and archipelagos. The captain turned his attention back to the map, his face so close to the panel that his breath misted the surface. They all watched as his head hovered over the virtual sea as if sailing. Then, all of a sudden, he tapped hard upon the glass. There! There's cover and timber aplenty. Slip, tell North to set a course, east, southeast. He looked at his bosun, a devilish smile splitting his face. Kim Paka, we're going to the graveyard. Our voyage through the world of the Risen Tide continues in the next chapter, which will be here on YouTube in just a few days. New chapters will be uploaded on Monday and Thursday every week. Hit subscribe to stay up to date. Or, if you just can't wait, the full tale is available today on Audible, Spotify and more. Thanks for listening.